You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, as always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we are joined by Bill Ham, who's the COO of Broadwell Company. Did I say it right? Did I buy you? Property Group, yeah. <laughs> Broad, Broadwell Property Group. Bill, um, I followed you on social media for a while. I remember when your last book came out. Super excited to hear you have another one coming out. Um, love the content you put out. Love the company you keep. Uh, the, the Jake and Gino guys are awesome. I lo- really love the whole community. So thanks for uh, thanks for reaching out and really ha- glad to have you on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So, Bill, for those for our listeners that aren't familiar with y- you and your your work, uh, can you please get Give us a, you know, a rundown of your story, how you got into real estate, what you did before and what you're doing today. Absolutely. So um, I have been in real estate for 16 years now. I started in 05. Um, I was a corporate pilot by trade and, you know, came out of school, started flying airplanes. And I uh, back in sort of 04, 05, 06, kind of going into that range, I, I saw friends of mine flipping houses and, you know, and I thought, well, these guys are idiots. You know, they're friends of mine. It's like, we were all hanging out at the bar last night. We were all doing the same thing. And I, wait a minute, I got up and went to work and you got up and flipped a house and made as much money as I made working all year, flipping a few houses. Like, wait a second, something is very, very wrong with this picture. And so that was my kind of personal aha moment, which is monkey see monkey do. You know, I'm looking at my friends making a lot of money flipping houses going, there's nothing special about these people. They're, you know, they're normal people. Why am I doing this and they're doing that and they're getting such different results than I am? And so that's when I really kind of spent about a year just reading books, you know, rich dad, poor dad, all the stuff we've all read and just going through material, kind of trying to figure out like, what are these people up to? And, and so after about a year of study and I did my very first deal, my very first deal was a duplex. And um, I, it was cash flowing about 300 bucks a month, if nothing broke. And uh, I had saved up $10,000 to my name. So I had 10 grand and $300 a month cash flow. And I turned in my two week notice, uh, walked away from the aviation career, went straight into real estate and said, you know what? I'm a genius. So I'm going to go out here and figure out real estate. What I figured out is I wasn't as smart as I thought, first of all. Uh, second of all, uh, survived it, you know, learned a ton, made a ton of money, lost a ton of money, survived all that, picked it back up. And now I've been out here for 16 years. Um, over time, I got into commercial uh, apartments. Now, all I do are larger apartment communities. Uh, but I started off with houses and duplexes and, and over the years just built my way up. And now I am two time best selling author on Amazon. And I have two books out there that sort of uh, teach that whole entire process. Awesome. Sounds like uh, quite quite a story you have there. I really like what you said about your buddies, you know, being idiots and them, and that, and, and we use that term affectionately. But like, sure. same here. I met, I went to Aria and I met some millionaires that couldn't tie their shoes. And I'm like, right. these guys, you're like, <laughs> what am I missing? Like, what's going yeah. on with me? Yeah. So that I think that's what holds so many people back is they yeah. think you need some kind of like higher education or you need to be in some kind of, oh. but I mean, most of the, the real estate success story, they're just average guys who are committed to not oh. giving up. They're, they're just normal people. And they, they, they got an education. They got some information. They took action on the information. They continued to take action. They got more information and, and now they're successful. It's, it's very simple. You know, so it really is. I'm curious about this part of your story because it's, you know, a lot of the times I use just this platform as an excuse to ask really smart guys a, a, their opinion because of personal sure. situations sure. I'm going I'm through. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I have, I have a bunch of single family houses and a bunch of duplexes and, and we just started putting together some larger pr- complexes. Good. And I find a lot of people in the, in the space, in the, large apartment space kind of look down their nose. Like I used to do single families, but I don't do those anymore with me. I'm like, man, every time one lands in my lap, it's like 50 grand in equity and a couple hundred month cash flow. Why would I stop doing that? Um, And I've been saying that for years, but now I'm to the point where like, I'm just, I'm like, my bandwidth is just spread thin. So when I I, I, like, I want to like whittle down the focuses of my life. You know what I mean? Because I feel like I'm doing 10 different things kind of half ass, you know, where I could do two really well. And so what did that transition look like for you? Did you did you sell off all your single, you, you see some of these guys sell off every single family house they have. Other ones just kind of let it sit and bake in the background. 
Um, and if you sold it off the whole portfolio, why did you choose to do that? Did you need the capital to go into these bigger properties or what was your reasoning besi- behind yeah, a lot, a lot, liquidating Yeah, a lot of that? answers in there. Yeah, definitely. So um, one, I, I did wind up after holding on to those houses for about 10 years, wind up selling off. Yes. So okay. did I sell off immediately? No. Did I eventually? Yes. Um, I am big into market cycles, and that's something that I teach a lot about in these books is market cycles, understanding where we're at in an economic cycle and a real estate cycle and where we believe we're going. And so I bought these properties a long time ago, and I waited for a better market and able to sell. So I waited for the values to go up. Now, uh, these properties, these houses were bought in Macon, Georgia. That's where I'm from, M-A-C-O-N, mm-hmm. Macon, Georgia. And that's kind of a, a relatively depressed market. It's not an economically strong area. Sure. So I bought these houses back in 2005, six, seven, eight, you know, nine. And I thought back then, okay, we're super smart, right? We're, we're buying these houses for $25,000, $30,000 in foreclosure, renting them out for five, 600 bucks, making you know, good cash flow. But three years ago, back in 20, 2002, 2003, 2004, man, these were $80,000 houses. And we're, we're buying them today for $20,000, $25,000. You know, my friends and I are high-fiving each other. We're geniuses. Well, the properties went on down to about five to 7000 in value. And they hung there for a while. And then eventually they creeped back up to $25,000, $30,000. And I, and I sold off uh, in the end. So yes, they cash flowed. Yes, we made money. But uh, you know what I want people to understand is that properties do always go up in value. Question is, are you going to live long enough? Right. So right. yes, I agree. Real estate always goes up in value in a long-term window, but in a short term, don't think that property values can't decline. Yes, they can. I, I'm living proof that they can. And so that's why I'm really big on teaching market cycles and knowing how real estate ebbs and flows and how values move based on certain things in the market. And that's what I talk a lot about in these books. So the idea uh, was I needed to wait until the next buyer cycle or seller cycle to be able to sell these properties off. And that's why I held on to them instead of just uh, dumping them early on. But yes, um, I, I did ultimately wind up getting into larger commercial. I don't buy houses anymore, but I completely agree with some of your first questions. If something's making money, why would you stop doing that to go over here and do something different? You shouldn't. You know, I have people ask me this question all the time. I'm making a kill and flipping houses, uh, but I want to go buy apartments. Why? I mean, you're, you're telling me that you're making great money and you want to stop making great money to go maybe make money over here. No, no, no. If you're making money, keep doing it. Now, if you want to add another model, if you want to go to the next level, fine. But, you know, then we get into what you're talking about, Sterling, which is uh, opportunity cost. And you, you can get spread too thin. So now what you have to do is kind of back up and say, where, what do I want to do every day? What asset class do I want to live in? And am I making enough money in that asset class? If, if you're buying and flipping houses and making a good living and you, you enjoy it, keep doing it. If you say, yeah, but I'm getting tired of the transactions. I'm getting tired of living paycheck to paycheck or house to house. I want to build more of a portfolio. Okay, now you probably want to start moving towards commercial because now we're getting into what we call a well, scale. Well, and so you lack that in houses. Uh, for sure. To clarify, I don't yeah. sell any of my house. I've never sold a house. And that was my question. When I transitioned full-time to commercial, yeah. you know, is You're there right. an argument, uh, no reason to sell them, right? Just let them sit there and bake. So yeah, I have, I, would. I have two questions. Um, one is my second question. And it's because you, you, uh, brought up your expertise in market cycles and in the crazy market environment right now. I want to spend the next 30 minutes talking about that. Sure. But before we get there, I'm curious what happened in Macon to do that to, to the, the property values? Um, lots of things. Well, one, you have to kind of understand that real estate and all assets are only valued by someone that, that wants to pay more than you pay. That's it. It's, the, it's literally the greater fool theory of investing. If I buy it for one, I'm hoping there's a greater fool that'll buy it for two. And so why would values decline in that area? Because people's attitude about real estate in that area declined. Why did people's attitude decline in that area? Largely economics, job growth, population growth, things like that. That particular city um, was, was not doing very well, economically speaking. We know when we went through 08, going on up into probably 2012, that was kind of a tough area for real estate. 
So Macon, Middle Georgia was already a semi-economically depressed area. It wasn't hard for it to kind of go lower when the rest of the world went lower, you know, and now it's it's back, it's doing fine. But again, it's all about the ebb and flow of, of economics and market cycles and understanding where you're at, where you're going. And most importantly, what's your exit strategy? See, that was something I never paid any attention to early on. I just buy it and thought, well, I'll just buy real estate and sit here forever. Yeah, but you need to have an exit strategy. Your exit strategy can be hold and operate, can be, but you need to conceptualize what it is you're trying to do with this real estate so that you know when you've accomplished it. You know, and, and people say, well, why would I ever sell real estate? Well, because sometimes somebody comes in and writes you a really big check and you make a lot of money doing it, you know? And, and so they say, well, why won't I just hold real estate and, and hold on to it forever and let it cash flow? Because it gets old, because it'll rot eventually and the repairs and maintenance and the capital expense items will start to outpace the profit. And hopefully you've, you've owned it long enough that you've had some great appreciation. So in your case, you have a bunch of houses. If they're not bothering you, the repairs and maintenance aren't bothering you in the end. The portfolio is not bothering you. Keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. I think holding real estate long-term is the best strategy, but you have to understand that these, these properties will become obsolescent at a point in time. And the business model may turn into where you're now having to roll more money back into the, the building. Then you are really pulling out cash flow. That's when you want to kind of, you know, sell that asset upgrade to a, to a better portfolio. But that would be my short answer. Awesome. So now I want to pivot to the market cycle. So do you have a, a general thesis or a general, you know, five minute overview of, of the cyclical nature of real estate and what, 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 ha- you know, I guess an elevator pitch to summarize sure, the sure. topic to our, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, markets, market cycles follow the business market cycles. And you can Google that if you're listening to this, probably the quickest thing to do is Google, uh, you know, business market cycles. You basically have a handful of cycles. And so just imagine a wavy line, you know, a sine, cosine, wavy line. So as we're going up the hill, up the market, that's the market getting better and better. Prices are going up. Economy is getting better. Real estate's getting better. That's what we call our expansion window. I believe we have been in an expansion cycle over the last seven years, five, seven years. All right. And then we go into a peak cycle. That's sort of the top of the hill, right? That kind of levels off for a while. We run in that peak cycle. Then we go into a recession cycle. And I'm using the word recession. I don't mean that in the sense of an economic GDP technical definition of recession. I'm talking about a real estate recession. So that's where we kind of uh, interest rates tend to rise. Uh, you know, values kind of cool off. That's good. Then we go into a trough cycle. That's the bottom of the market. And you, you, know, you go along there for a while and then we go back into a, a, um, an expansion cycle again. So it's a, you know, a rise, level off, decline, level off, rise, level off. That's roughly the, the 10,000 foot view of a market cycle. What I think really, really occurs with when we're discussing like prices and things like that is that the prices rise up, level off for a while, decline slightly, level off for a while, and then rise up heavily again, giving the overall perception of left to right, real estate always appreciates. The line always goes up and to the right. Yes, I agree over a 50 year window, a hundred year window, a long window, but when we zero into a 10 year window, a five year window, yeah, you may see micro slides up and down. And that has to do with location, neighborhood, area, property, the city, the nation, you know, things of that nature. So that's kind of roughly market cycles. Um, you know, again, I, you can look up sort of the, the, the cycles online. Um, I teach what I call the three pillars of real estate. And that's the three concepts that you absolutely must get right in real estate in order to ultimately be successful. It's market cycle. That's one pillar. Debt and exit strategy. Those are your three things. So you kind of want to know where you're at in the market cycle, where you think you're going. Obviously, we don't have a crystal ball, but you kind of guesstimate about where you think the cycles are going. And then you ask yourself, okay, what is the exit strategy for this property? Am I going to sell it, uh, fix and flip, burr, refinance? Like, what am I doing here? When does that going to when is that going to come due? So if I'm buying something, I'm going to fix it and I'm going to refinance it in two years. Fine. But I need to look at the market and say, well, what do I believe interest rates are going to do in two years? What do I believe the market's going to be in two years? So that's your, your exit strategy. You overlay that on your market cycle. And then third, you've got to get the right loan that fits that. So for example, I see people making this kind of mistake. Hey, I'm going to buy this property, renovate it, and I'm going to refinance it in two years. 
and pull out all of my cash. But today I'm going to go get a 10 year Fannie Mae fixed note so that I can refi and pull all my money out in two years. No, you're not. No, you are not because that Fannie Mae loan comes with a huge prepayment penalty. You're not going to refinance out of that deal in two years without giving up all your profit and prepayment. So right concept, right exit strategy, wrong debt. See, so if you want that exit strategy, you better go over to community bank. You better go get a bridge loan, get something that's easy to exit. If your business model, more like yourself, is hold and operate long term, yeah, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, agency debt, great for that. Not so great for a quick exit. So it's all about timing those three concepts together. And that's why I call those the three pillars of real estate. Awesome. So how do the different asset classes relate to one another in these market cycles? So... You know, a, a 2008 type recession is obviously detrimental for, you know, uh, houses in the country club. How might that affect an affordable housing complex in Knoxville? Yeah, good, good question. Um, different ways. I, you know, we, are we talking strictly apartments? Are we talking all asset classes like hotels, storage, apartments? You know, I mean, so it's all kind of largely moves together based on the availability of lending. So that's kind of the most 10,000 foot answer I can give you is look at your debt. And as interest rates go up and as lenders start lending less, you will typically see prices decline across all asset classes. Now, you know, storage and, and multifamily and hotels and houses, they all move cyclically different. So, you know, that, that's kind of the specifics there. Um, I would say today, projecting forward, what we really want to be paying attention to is inflation. You know, and so what I see a lot of people doing right now is saying, well, the price of this property is very uh, high. It's expensive, but that's okay because I'm going to raise the rents. And as soon as I raise the rents, then this property makes a lot of financial sense. Okay, great. I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, hold on. If inflation continues at the rate it's going, yes, you're going to raise the rents, but so is everything else. So is everything else going to go up? And so are these rents that we're seeing today sustainable if your tenant is forced with high gas prices, high food prices, cost of living, everything goes up, can they afford that rent? And so that's where I'm just kind of cautioning people that are analyzing deals today in being too aggressive with projecting rent growth over the next year or two. Because yes, we saw massive rent growth in 2021. We also saw the feds put out a lot of stimulus money in that same year. You know, so so be careful. There's a big correlation between those two. And if the feds don't continue to put out that money, clearly they're not. Then do we see this inflation? Do we see these these uh, rent growth at the same pace? I'm going to say no, probably not. So I would be very careful about over speculating about rent growth. And that's what's going to affect, uh, I think, our asset classes more than anything going forward. But again, that's one man's opinion. So. On the topic of inflation, because it is a very, very hot topic at the moment, and and I'm I'm still dumbfounded by all the folks who act surprised that it's here, right? Because I, I agreed. I, yeah, hello. I, rem, I remember March of 2020 when they started printing money. I was like, oh, this is gonna cause massive inflation, and a lot of like fancy folks were giving me some kind of like, oh well, not necessarily. I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah, this is gonna, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna cause a bunch of inflation. And so here we are, and the same fancy folks are going, man, nobody could have seen that coming. They're like, like you know, no, no, I, I, I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, how does that impact um, the the different asset classes, and, and and really a conversation that I have a hard time articulating sometimes. So I'm, I'm curious if you have a better explanation on it. Um, and my opinion is that it's the inflation is better for the real estate than it is for, like, say, the stock market. I would agree. Uh, yeah. Yes. I, I think holding real estate long term forever is the best business model. Now, I have to look at the, the assets going to get older. But yes, I agree that inflation will be good for those that own assets and want to sell because it's going to keep the prices up. Agreed. Um, the real question here that I think we need to be asking is, are we going to see cap rates continue to decline? So what we've seen right now is people buying real estate so aggressively that they're willing at each sale to accept lower and lower and lower returns. So are we going to continue to see the returns declining like we've been seeing? I think that's the question we need to be asking. And I, I think the answer is probably not. So yes, I believe inflation is going to hold steady the price and maybe even keep the prices moving up. 
that's fine. But if the rents don't go up in lockstep with that pricing, then the returns, the cash flow is just steadily on the decline. And, and that's where I'm kind of asking people. It's like, I don't know that that's going to, I don't know how that, that's going to last. You know, I kind of like to ask the question and I can ask you, you know, Sterling, do you own any stocks? I ask students and people all around, do you have to own any stocks, any kind of stock, you know? Sure. Okay. Does that stock, do you own any stocks that don't produce dividends? You know, they don't pay, they don't pay any kind of dividend. You own it. Yeah. Okay. Over the last year, would you say that stock went up in value? Yeah. Why? It's not cash flowing. It's not paying a dividend. It's not producing a damn thing. Yeah, it went up in value. Why? Is real estate headed in that direction? Are we saying that we are going to buy and sell real estate and it's always going to go up in value with no cash flow? See, I don't know that I'm, I'm completely buying into that concept right there. Yeah. But if we continue to look at the trends in the market and if prices continue to go up and the rents don't go up along with the prices, then that's exactly what we're saying. They're all just sitting around and buying and sell real estate with no cash flow. And I'm not buying that. So somewhere something's got to give. Correct me if if I'm not, it's been a long day. So I might be making a, a conceptual hiccup here, but if if inflation goes up and the rents keep increasing, right? We're going to drive NOI up. Um, right. w- will that not drive continue to drive the price up even without changing the cap rate? It, it will hold, it could. Yeah. So if if the price goes up and the rent goes up, the cap rate will stay right where it is. And that's already kind of low, right? But if the price goes up and the rent doesn't follow it as quickly, then you're seeing cap rate compression. And that means that now the next buyer is willing to accept less and less and less cash flow with each transaction. And so what I'm saying is prices have jumped up rapidly, rapidly. But if the rents go up to match the prices, then we have to have wage growth go up to match the rent sure. growth and the rent growth has to go. Yeah. But then, then the, the, the companies that are paying more in wages now have to charge more for their goods and services to pay the employees and the employees need it to pay the rent and the whole thing. Inflation. And you're staring down the barrel of, of a lot of circular inflation like that. And so that's where I'm kind of saying, I believe that we are going to see prices cool off and level while the rents continue to climb, which is then going to start to give us better and better cash flow, because I don't see people buying and selling assets, physical tangible assets in America without the metric of cash flow. It's easy to buy a stock, you know, on an app, you know, Robinhood or something like that, and they went up in value. And there's no mortgage, there's no tenants, there's no trash and toilets you got to deal with. It's a stock, it's a paper asset, easy peasy. Your apartment complex, hold on, that's a completely different animal. And I don't think you're going to want to go over there. What are we doing that. all this for anyway? There you go. You're going to go buy all this real estate and mortgages and all this kind of stuff for no cash flow. Really? I don't think I'm buying that. So that means the only other answer in the world is that the prices have to level off and let those rents go on up to start producing more cash flow. Because if the rent goes up, yeah, but the price does too. There's that's a net nothing. And, and if we continue that kind of trend, real estate goes to an area where it no longer cash flows and we just sell it and buy and sell real estate like your stock. Maybe it's not to say that's impossible. It's not because look, you bought a stock, it went up in value, no reason why, but you make gold. Gold doesn't produce cash flow, goes up in value. Land, land doesn't produce, goes up in value. So I'm not saying there's no model where this occurs. It certainly is. Is real estate about to be the next model? Uh, that I'm questioning. I, I, I don't know that I agree with the concept that we'll all just buy real estate with no cash flow. But if you look at cap rate trends over the last 20 years, it says that that's where we're going. And so I disagree. So I think what we're really about to see is a shift in the market, another down cycle, which is why I brought out the book Creative Cash, because when lenders start stop lending as much, then you're going to need other techniques to get these deals funded, especially older buildings that have deferred maintenance. You know, when your lender says, sure, we'll, we'll do that building for you. You've just got to put up a million dollars in escrow because the plumbing's no good. The roofs are no good. That hurts numbers. That hurts cash flow. And so that's where I think you're going to see a lot of people starting to use things like mash lease options, seller financing, different techniques that I've written about in this book to get deals done where that traditional lender may not be there ready to fund a, a distressed asset in the future. And if interest rates go up, which we know they are, that's only going to exacerbate that problem of, of a distressed asset being hard to fund. And that's why I brought that material out, creative cash. 
Awesome. Love it. And that's how I, I bought most of my uh, early properties was all seller financing and, and uh, different creative strategies. So I, I love the, Absolutely. love the topic. Um, tell us about your second book. That you, that yeah. Second book is released. real estate raw. And that's, that's this one. And this actually launched uh, yesterday and we've hit number one bestseller on the Amazon uh, in Amazon for the Kindle version. So real estate raw, uh, and there's also the website realestateraw.com. You can go, but the the book here is the step by step instruction on how to build a real estate portfolio, start to finish. So I wrote the real estate raw book, uh, assuming like you you've never heard about real estate, you can't even spell real estate. Then this book is for you. You know, it starts step one: choose a market. Step two: we're going to get deal flow from the market. We're going to learn how to analyze deals. We're going to, we're going to learn how to talk to realtors. Then we're going to learn structuring, funding, you know, lending, all of that. All of that is in the real estate raw book. That's your instruction manual on how to build a portfolio. Creative cash is how to use creative financing to fund the concepts in real estate raw. So both of them together are kind of a total package. You have how to do it in, in real estate raw and you have how to get it funded with creativity and creative cash. And both of them together Pretty, pretty powerful set of data. And it's it's what uh, I think people are going to use to go out and, and really build their, their uh, portfolios over the next few years. Awesome. Looking forward to checking them both out. Um, what is next for you, Bill? Are you How are you preparing for this potential softening? Well, I, I, I've sold a lot of real estate. So, you know, I wish I had more to sell. So I've, I've been in that seller over the last couple of years, done, or last year, done really well in the sales, made great money. Yes. So we're in a good cash position. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm sticking to my guns on underwriting. So I know what a good deal is. I'm, I'm very active. I look for deals every day, but I'm not chasing deals. So I, I still have my model. And if I find what I like, I buy it. If I don't, I, I kind of go play golf or do something else, but I don't chase yeah. deals. Right. And so I'm kind of waiting for that market to shift. I'm not doing as many transactions at the moment because the market's a little inflated. But um, next for me is, is you know, working on the, the education, um, you know, which is a form of networking for me. You know, these books are a form of networking, credibility. Um, so I'm always raising podcasts. My, yeah, podcast. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm always, you know, uh, reaching out, putting people together, putting people on my investor list. So, by the way, hey, if you want to learn how to invest with me, I'll put my email address out there. But yeah, that's the key. It's it's just creating content, uh, you know, getting getting known and putting out your material. Uh, it's like I always say, it's it's being known to, or being unknown doesn't pay that well. Yeah, you know, so I'm just out working on my network, you know, doing shows like yours and and creating content and just getting my brand going. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I've been working on. It's a, it's a it's a function of raising money is what it really is. You know? Sure, absolutely. Education. And, and um, you know, you you kind of touched on a topic that I, I like to talk about a lot, and it's that you know when there's deals in the market, there's typically no money, and when there's money in the market, there's typically no deals, right? So I, I have friends that are just starting out. You know, they're the they're the guy who needs to read real estate raw and they go and, and they're like, well, I have all this equity in my house. I'm like, pull it out. And they're like, well, but I'm going to be paying interest in the meantime while I don't have a deal. I'm like, pull it out right now. Because when it comes time that like real estate's on sale, they're not going to give it to you. You're not going to be able to access it when you need it. <laughs> yeah, it was bingo. like go pay the fifty dollars a month interest and in, like in the meantime, Have access to it. You yeah, know. absolutely. Yeah, you know, and when a deal comes, and, and to your point, you know, when it when a a hot deal comes along, it doesn't stick around long. It's not it's not waiting around, you know, to be asked out of the date. It, it's gone. You know, sure. a good deal comes and goes. And you better be ready. You better have the cash and you better jump on it because a good deal is not going to sit around waiting for you to refinance this and then maybe buy this. Yeah. No, I'll buy it. You'll buy it. Somebody will buy it. You know, so right. yeah, you got to be ready. You got to be ready to take action. And, and that's kind of what I'm, I've got more of a cash position kind of, you know, waiting to go into a different market cycle. And uh, so I'm recommending everybody right now really focus on networking, you know, maybe getting your, your equity teams together, maybe like you're saying, get, get hold of liquidity and get ready for, a, for a, a, an upcoming shift in the market. I mean, I've been waiting for it for years. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's <laughs> coming. No, it is coming. <laughs> um, I will say this as a counterpoint to to our conversation, which I'm on the same page with you as. But uh, when I when I started investing in real estate five years, four years ago, they told me it, it was about to crash and that I should wait for the crash. So if I would, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have any of the stuff I have. Right. Um, totally agree. Don't wait. Don't wait. You know, cause people ask me that all the time. And, and, you know, if your listeners are thinking the same question, like, well, gosh, 
if things are going to do this or that, shouldn't I just wait? No, no, not at all. Because number one, for several comments, you know, the only better time to have gotten into real estate than today was yesterday, right? You, you figured that out. Number the best, one, number- the best, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Exactly. The second best time is today. You know, it's like, yeah, so, so just get started. Number one. Number two, if you're new to the business, what I have found, and I've been teaching real estate for long, about 10 years, and I've had hundreds of students. And what I've come to realize is it takes people about a year, maybe 18 months to really get that first deal. And then it takes a couple of years to really get that first portfolio going. So even if you get started today, you're not starting in the market today as it is today. You're probably really starting in a market that's a year or two from today. And so if you believe a year or two from today is a better time to buy or maybe a better time to buy, there's no better time to get started than today because you want to get your team together, your your information and go into that that down cycle with momentum. If you think you're going to time the bottom of the market, just hop in at the bottom, then it may take you a year or two or three to get really established. You're halfway back up the other market cycle again. So it's like now is the, the best time because you you can get in and we can really build our teams on that down cycle or, or in the level off cycle. I don't think we're headed for any kind of major crash. Let me be real clear. I don't think we're going back through a way the whole world is going to fall apart. I don't think that's going to occur, but I do think we're going to have a cooling off window. And so that's where you want to be reading books like mine, you know, get your creative financing techniques together, learn how to do all that kind of stuff, and then learn how to find these types of deals and sellers. It's all about the seller. So you're really after a certain type of seller, get ready. And and I think you're going to be uh, in a real good position. Awesome. So real quick, I want to hop to our radio round. It's just three quick questions for our listeners. The first one is what's your favorite book that you didn't Mm -hmm. write? Uh, Oh, that's, that's an easy question. (laughs) Actually, I got it. Royal tears too. Got it right here in my book. Machiavelli, the Prince. Okay. Right here on my desk. Keep it on the desk. And the second one is Sun Tzu's Art of War. So can't make that. I didn't know you were going to ask that question, but I literally keep these two on my desk at all times. So I'd probably answer that in a two prong. Those are probably two of my favorite books uh, that I think people should, that are in business, should know and understand. These two gentlemen didn't write these books about business, but if you have a business mind and you can really understand these books from a business concept, tremendously valuable. If you read The Prince in high school or something like that, forget it, go back and reread it again with your adult mind. And if you haven't, I strongly sure. recommend you read it now. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I revisited it a couple of years ago. You got it. Yeah. Cause you couldn't make, you can't make sense of it in high school. That's what I said. It was a way, it was almost <laughs> stupid to tell us to read that in high school. You know, it was like, we yeah. didn't care to read this. Like, yeah, whatever. Now there's a reason for it. I'd recommend it. For sure. Absolutely. What's your favorite quote? Favorite quote? I'd probably have to like. I'll go with Nike. Just do it. Just, just yeah. do it. Because I'm, you know, I hate that they coin that because I say it all the time. It's just like, <laughs> just do it. You know what I mean? Stop thinking. Stop. Stop worrying about it. Just get started. Go do it. You know. It, it, and I would even say that to somebody who may have been listening to some of the stuff that we're talking about. You know, if you're new to this business and you you haven't gotten started, forget everything that we were talking about. Turn all this off. Just go get started. Don't worry about yeah. it. You know, sometimes you can let in too much white noise. You can let in too many opinions. And, well, what about this? What about that? And you can kind of talk yourself out of taking action. And, and it's like I say, you can't sit in the driveway and wait for all the lights to turn green before you back out. You're never going to get out the driveway, right? Just get started. Just I, go I always tell people, we'll I, out I, I tell people to buy it. They'll send me a deal. Like people that, that people that have never bought anything, they'll send me a deal and I'll say, buy it. And they go, do you think it's a good deal? I'm like, no, but I think you should buy something. Like yeah. it doesn't matter if you lose your first money on your first deal, that, you're going to learn, you're going to get over the fear and fear. then you're going to go buy it. It's not going to make you go bankrupt, you, right? You're not, not going to get cares. rich. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is called, it's like, you, you got to build a ship to wreck every now and then you got to build one just to wreck it. Right. It's like, you got to go out and, and you're, you're going to, you're going to mess up. You know, my, my favorite thing that I like to tell students is look, you buy one. If you screw up one, buy two. If you screw up two, buy 10, you'll get it right eventually. Just don't stop, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. hey, you completely wrecked that first deal. Good for you. Now go buy another one. If you wreck that one too, good for you. Go buy a whole pile of them. You'll get yeah. it right eventually. Just don't and, stop. And the more That's, you have, the more forgiving those things are, right? Cost average the mistake. You know what yeah. I mean? I've, I have abandoned more real estate than most people will ever close. I've abandoned about 10 different properties in the past because the operations went bad, whatever the case. And I said, you know what? Screw it. Throw it in the pile. I'll go buy five more. They'll cash flow. We'll forget that one. Just keep going. You, you cost average the mistake. And a lot of people go, oh, you're completely nuts. I'm like, no, that's business. If you think you're going to get it 100% right 100% of the time, you're not in business. You're out your mind. You know, there's no way. You're going to fail some. And that's a good thing. You know? Yeah, go, but just buy it. Is it going to be perfect? Probably not. Who cares? 
I'm with you. So what, what's your favorite thing to do outside of work? Ooh, um, I like to, I'm a gardener, actually. I like to garden and, and grow stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm big into gardening. Um, I like uh, I like uh, water skiing, water sports, stuff like that. Uh, I kind of grew up on a lake. So it's probably things I do a lot of times outside of real estate. Read. Uh, I like to read a lot. Pretty boring person, I guess, in that regard. <laughs> Cool, oh, cool. So, um, how can our listeners find out more about you? Where can they Absolutely. find your books? Where can they get in touch with you to invest or, sure. or coach or whatever? Give you all the information. All right. So, the books uh, quickly again is Creative Cash. That's the the book on creativity and Real Estate Raw. Both books are available on Amazon. Uh, they're in Kindle, Audible, and and paperback. So you can just go on Amazon and get those. Um, my website is real estate raw, just like the book. Um, I have some free training videos on there. I have information on there. So if you want a, a free video on how to get started in real estate, just check out real estate raw. You can also contact me through that site as far as investing, but I'd be happy to give everybody my email address. So if you have any thoughts, comments, or concerns, feel free to email me. If you want to find out how you can do business with me in the future, just send me an email and I'll reach back out to you. We'll talk offline. But uh, my email is bill at gobroadwell.com. So it's Bill, B-I-L-L, at gobroadwell, B-R-O-A-D-W-E-L-L, gobroadwell.com. And uh, and that's it. Just look me up. And if you want to find out stuff I've put out there, I know this always kind of sounds arrogant when I say it, but if you Google Bill Ham Real Estate, you'll pull up about 10 pages of other material and other videos and other podcasts, things I put out there. I have a lot of material, a lot of free material. So if you're really looking to, to get started in real estate, um, just give me a search. I can't, I can't wait till I can tell people to Google me. Just if you, that if doesn't you, sound like such a jerk thing to say. Like, I hate actually if you, saying if that. You go, if you Google Sterling Chapman, you'll find a college basketball player. And it's well, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Like, great, great point. If you Google just Bill Ham, you actually find the old guy from ZZ Top. You're, you're old enough to remember ZZ Top. You have the beard and he's been so Bill Ham was one of the guys that had long beard and ZZ Top. He's a little bit more famous than I am. So if you just Google Bill Ham, you'll pull him up. You'll find me a page or two down. But if you put real estate, I should have said that. If you put real estate behind my name, then you'll you'll pull up everything then. Yeah. So I'm not the, this 90 year old guy from ZZ Top at the beard. That's not me. Uh, that is Bill Ham. Spelled the exact same way too. So I'm trying to I'm trying to outrank that guy. I got a little ways to go. <laughs> nice. we'll get it. Awesome. Well, Bill, I, I really appreciate having you Absolutely, on. Yeah. I really enjoyed chatting, and Thank you uh, on. definitely look forward to uh, checking out your books and keeping up with you on your journey. Well, cool. appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show, brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at crestworthcapital.com or rentrollradio.com or follow us on Facebook at Rentroll Radio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at rentrollradio.com or sterling at crestworthcapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.